All right, everybody, I think we're going to get started. If you can take your seats. Just waiting on a couple faculty back there. Well, good evening. My name is Andy Kripe, and I'm the Dean of Student Affairs here at Northwood University. That's where I wait for applause. All right. Thank you for being with us tonight. Tonight is the third night in Values Emphasis Week. And as you all know, in Values Emphasis Week, we celebrate the Northwood idea and our code of ethics. And tonight we have a special guest who is a shining example of both those. And it's an honor to introduce her. Star Parker is the president of CURE, the Center for Urban Renewal and Education, a public policy think tank that seeks to address issues of culture, race, and poverty from a Judeo-Christian conservative perspective. From welfare mother to businesswoman, national celebrity, and international author, Star Parker exemplifies hard work, aspiration, and individual responsibility. She is a young leader, and she's the kind of leader that we cherish here at Northwood. Cure serves to lead others to follow her example and bring new energy to policy discussions in Washington. Star is a nationally syndicated columnist with Creator Syndicate and a best-selling author with four books, including Blind Conceit, which offers a way for America to move forward on the issues of racial polarization, politics, and policy, as well as Uncle Sam's Plantation, which details how big government enslaves America's poor and what we can do about it. She regularly cons consults with both federal and state legislators on market-based strategies to fight poverty and has spoken at over 180 colleges and universities about anti-poverty initiatives. A number of organizations have endorsed STAR's work. Those include the Susan B. Anthony List, Eagle Forum, Heritage Foundation, Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, Family Research Council, Young America's Foundation, Conservative Leadership PAC, and the American Conservative Union. STAR's public policy work has been endorsed by over 50 nationally acclaimed figures and elective officials, including Dr. James Dobson, Pat Boone, Steve Forbes, Morton Blackwell, Phyllis Shafley, Dr. Ben Carson, Senator Ted Cruz, Representative Mia Love, Senator Tim Scott, Representative Kevin McCarthy, and Senator Mike Lee. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in joining Star Parker to the stage. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. And I have to admit, though, I didn't always have that bio uh, or the values that you're celebrating this week that undergird your university. In fact, um, I was very lost uh, in my values, I suppose, if you called them that. I believed for years the lies of the left. A lot of these lies you still hear today. I believe that um, you know, the poor were poor because the wealthy were wealthy and that my problems were somebody else's fault and that America was so inherently racist I didn't need to mainstream. And I just heard that all my life from everybody that said that they represented my interests because they wore the same color skin I did. So early on, I got lost in some very aggressive values, uh, values of criminal activity and drug activity and sexual activity in and out of abortion clinic after clinic. It wasn't until after the fourth time I went into one of their so-called safe, legal, rare abortions, uh, abortion clinics that I had a gut instinct way down deep inside that there's just got to be something wrong with killing your offspring. And I decided I wasn't going to go in abortion clinic again, but I didn't change my sexual patterns and was pregnant again within a very short period of time. And kind of proud of myself that I could at least narrow down to two who the father of the child was and uh, and landed on the welfare state and uh, had been in and out for about four and a half years to, by then and ended up living there three and a half years watching my life go into a little dark hole 
And it wasn't until after a Christian conversion that I just totally changed my life and adopted new values, the values of the, a biblical worldview, started getting into the scripture, then it got into school, got a college degree, and uh, ended up starting a business. Uh, during the 1992 Los Angeles riots, my uh, business was destroyed. But I'd already been working in social reform and activism and had become a spokesperson on some of the issues that uh, were challenging my community and landed in Washington, D.C., and that's why I run a policy institute there now. I had a little time in talk radio, and after ABC fired me for talking about things they didn't like me talking about, uh, I ended up um, not wanting to go back into talk radio. I wanted to do something about the problems, and so now uh, I have a window of opportunity. Uh, you know, people are very, they have various opinions about politics and Washington itself, and it is true that um, what Tip O'Neill said years ago, that it's like professional wrestling, uh, the conflicts for the crowd, uh, because at the end of the day, they're in business, and they're in the same business. So it's um, very difficult to interject any new thought or ideas, and so we built out machineries over a long period of time. And in fact, I think it was the, um, the president of Heritage Action who had said when the Tea Party showed up, I wish they'd stop saying that Washington's broken, we're going there to fix it. He said, Washington's not broken. It's a very well-oiled machine. It needs to be broken. Uh, and we find that today. But that's politics. There's a policy side, though. The policy side is more like baseball. It's not um, like professional mud wrestling. Uh, a lot of the work is done in preparation. Uh, the lobbyists are preparing for the day that the government comes after their business so they can go and stop them. Uh, the legislators are preparing to uh, perhaps uh, bid for the interests of their communities. And the way that we've organized our country, that we have various communities with various interests. And that's one of the reasons that there's a lot of ideas floating all the time and, uh, and some uh, counter and others. Uh, and um, the, the, the think tanks, the world that I run in, we're, we have ideas. We're in the idea world. We can't lobby, uh, so we persuade. Uh, we consult and we um, educate, if you will. Uh, but we do have interests, and my interests are uh, that quarter of the budget, that uh, $900 billion that we spend every year on anti-poverty programs. And I'm hard-pressed to find anyone that thinks one is working. So maybe one of you know one that's working. I don't know. I've been all over the country, all types of environments, including in the housing projects. And if I ask them, anything working for you? They're like, oh, get us out of here. How did you do it? In fact, one girl, after we did um, welfare reform, I consulted on that bill, uh, told me she hated my guts. The whole time I was um, doing welfare reform, because I, when uh, we uh, had a couple of instances we couldn't get the bill passed, um, we had to go on the Oprah Winfrey show to convince people that this was good for them, that they had cancer and we needed to go in and do some surgery. Uh, and so she saw me there and she told me she hated my guts and she wanted me dead. Uh, but after we passed the bill and she had to go get a job, she said that she began to love me because when she would get up and put her little uniform on, the way that her children started looking at her uh, was a big surprise to her. And she told me at that time, yeah, so I have your picture now and it's up right next to Snoop Dogg. And I said, oh, okay, that sounds like an accomplishment for me. So I come from a different perspective on some of the things that I want to talk to you about um, uh, uh, this afternoon. I'm, I'm so thankful that, you, uh, that you've invited me. Uh, one of the main reasons is because I've been in Washington since the election, and one of the lines in Hamilton uh, when they won the, the Revolutionary War, no one thought they were going to do that. And so at a certain point, they, they just say, we won. And they're like, we won? We won? Uh, and that's um, some of the feeling in Washington that freedom is... Uh, got a chance to survive in our society. Um, the last eight years, uh, groups like mine that are looking for market-based solutions to fight poverty were more on the, on the, um, uh, the defense. Uh, and now we're pretty much on the offense to be able to come up with opportunities to move us into freedom, respect, and responsibility, which is what I was asked to share with you. Those are uh, values that I think that we all should adopt. And at once upon a time, our culture actually had values to where we were consistent with each other to think that there are certain rules of engagement. Uh, there is an idea of freedom and what that means. And libertarians describe it as your freedom stops right about my nose. Uh, and we used to understand those boundaries. And most of the time, because the scripture talked about them, uh, King Solomon was very clear about not removing ancient landmarks. And uh, property rights was incredibly important. Uh, to, to, to freedom and ideas of freedom. Um, in particular, you look at just in Genesis, the very first uh, opportunity that God got to talk to the folks was that about property. You know, he said, you can have all of that, but that one tree is mine. And they didn't appreciate it. Uh, same way a lot of politicians in Washington don't appreciate just leaving that one little tree alone. Uh, and so we have very big challenges that we're trying to solve. And my work is focused on the least of those, that little weak link. And the reason that I wanted to talk to you about it is because, um, because it touches the ideas or the values of freedom and respect and responsibility, values that I lost 
I suppose, because I th still think that everybody at two years old kind of has some dream. Um, might even just be to steal their brother or sister's toy. But um, a little dream for a puppy. My little granddaughter just turned uh, five. Well, she'll be five tomorrow, and that's why I'm really excited about being here, because you got me out of Washington, so I can go home and see my grandkid before I have to go back to that god-awful place. Um, and so, uh, so uh, thank you for getting, getting, me, getting me up and, and, and leaving there. Uh, but she's got a little kitty cat because it's just obsessed with a little kitty cat. And so people have dreams when they're little, but you can lose them. You can lose values as well, including values of freedom, respect, and even responsibility. And so I want to know how we got here. Uh, I want to explore that with you. And I also want to talk about um, what we can do as private citizens to help our new leader, the new administration that is in Washington. But regardless of your political persuasion, is as a country, uh, we have an opportunity to move ideas forward, uh, whether it's under this president or even the last president. The last president moved a whole lot of ideas uh, forward, and some people opposed those ideas, uh, and, and some people um, respected one of those ideas, and now the driver is in the other um, uh, lane, the ball is in another court, and so we have an opportunity to perhaps move toward new ideas, and I believe that those ideas uh, will enhance um, the values of freedom, respect, and responsibility. So what can we do? Because one of the things that this new president has said over uh, the last eight months of his campaign was that he wanted to fix the inner cities. And he looked in the black community and said, uh, what do you have to lose? And he started naming out some stats of where we were really broken down. And he kept pointing to even Detroit, uh, even though that is not the whole picture of black America. And there are some that get offended when you just point to the weakest link. Uh, but the weakest link is draining. It's not only draining uh, the, the, the human potential, but it's draining as a country. It's, dra it's draining us as a country. It's draining uh, us when we look at values of freedom, respect, and responsibility. And so even though only 8% of blacks then took him up on he was going to fix the inner cities and decided to vote for him, uh, he still insisted that he wanted to fix the inner cities. Um, this president mentioned it again in his um, inaugural, and then he mentioned it again to the Congress. So there are ideas that are floating uh, to help do that. And so I hope that we'll be able to explore, and maybe you would even ask some questions uh, about these particular issues um, so that we can maybe help him do what he says he wants to do, which is uh, make America greater again. But as all social snapshots and financial forecasts today show us is that um, uh, what we should have learned from the riots of the 30s and of the 60s and of the 90s, maybe we might learn from the Black Lives Matters campaign now, having a large, chronically poor portion of our population is not good for them. It, it increases the, the um, moral and economic problems in their communities, but it's also uh, taxing for the entire country, local, state, and federal. And in fact, I look at all of the income and demographic data from all states everywhere I go, including all areas, like I looked at you. Uh, I love that little Google, because you can kind of look at everything and find out um, uh, about people that used to take forever to, to research or have to pay somebody to do the research for you. And you do have to check it because, of course, uh, anybody can put anything they want there. Uh, and so you want to go to credible sources. But I always look at the, the data when it comes to poverty rates, the poverty by race, the poverty by age, the poverty by family structure, the educational rates. I look at that by race, by age, by family structure, the crime rates by age, by family structure, by race. And what I find everywhere, absolutely everywhere, it does it all over the country regarding our most unprepared to mainstream. Those that are the weakest link, those that we, that, that, are say, that we are now saying, we've got to do something about this. Uh, I was reading a column coming in uh, on just the homeless and how many um, cities now, uh, because L.A. is such a magnet for the homeless, are, pay, are giving one-way tickets to their homeless just to go down to L.A. And they tell, life's better, there go. And so it's overwhelming now, uh, Los Angeles, when it comes to the homeless population. But it's everywhere, those that are unprepared to mainstream, whether they're urban or rural, native, or even spilling into our suburbs, or whether they're north or south or east or west, all the data shows the exact same thing, uh, that the social and economic challenges of these communities and for our country are rooted in two areas collapsed ethics and collapsed marriage. Talk about values. It's not an accident that poor children today are three times more likely to be born out of marriage than was the case before the left declared a war on the biblical truths that guided the establishment of our country. The left's answer to everything, where there are natural consequences to challenges when people buy into a secular 
uh, worldview, their answer is just pour government money at it. Government welfare, government schools, government housing, government wage laws, government jobs, government retirement. And all of these um, create the conditions that we see in our most hard hit uh, uh, and desperate and impoverished communities. A lack of marriage, which equals a lack of family. Lack of family equals lack of tradition. Lack of tradition equals lack of education. Lack of education equals a lack of a work ethic. And lack of a work ethic uh, means they have a lack of vision. And for those of you that have a biblical worldview, know that without a vision, uh, not only do you lose sight of your life, but crime runs rampant. And so what we're having as a result of this collapse of the ethics and the family values that used to be the pillars of our society is we're leaving behind social pathologies of what we're trying to address now in Washington so that we can address them in various states, in particular in our most hard hit communities. And it's what we're trying to do at Urban Cure, um, the policy institute that I run in DC. Because what we want are the answers to what is happening to these Americans that are so unprepared to live in the ideas of freedom respect and responsibility. Well, before we can answer that question, though, what do we need to do as a society to nudge them along, to help them discover the values of freedom, respect, and responsibility? Uh, we have to explore how did we get here. So what we need to do is look at what happened to us as a society that now half of our citizens in the country do not believe in the founding principles of this country, whether those are eternal truths, limited government, free markets, a pluribus unum. I mean, even the discussions about the pluribus unum now are, are subjective because people do not believe that we should many become one, that we should buy into ideas of diversity and multiculturalism, and, and it's not faring well as a unified nation. Well, what I've discovered is that America began a journey away from her founding principles about 50 years ago, and as a society, we got lost. It's easy to get lost. I just define myself as lost. It was very easy to get lost. When all that you hear is that there are no consequences to sin, uh, then you can get very, very lost. Uh, we had three things happen to our culture and the founding principles of our culture. Uh, all three happened in the 60s, way before some of you were born or even thought to be born, uh, or maybe were born as a result of some of these things that happened in the 60s. Uh, we had a war on religion. Uh, we scrubbed our schools from all reference of God, and it weakened us. It weakened our public institutions, and it opened the door to a culture of meaninglessness. Is it any wonder now we've gotten to where we can't trust any of the alphabet soup coming out of Washington, whether it's the, 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 the well, now the NSA is even on the, on the table. It's the IRS. We don't trust any of them. I don't care what their letters are. Uh, they, the, the TSA, I mean, they're talking now about uh, stopping laptops from coming on. And first thing people are thinking, they're going to steal them. Well, they do steal over there. <laughs> so we um, uh, have lost ourselves uh, and we have weakened our public institutions because we scrubbed our schools from any reference to God. But in that same 60s, we had a war on marriage through the feminist movement and it weakened women and it opened a door to a culture of materialism uh, and then a war on poverty, which weakened family and opened a door to this culture of entitlement. Uh, this very concept of redistribution of wealth to alleviate poverty, it not only violates private property, which is a absolute principle of freedom. You know, my granddad never met the man but uh, understand he had an edict. He was uh, one generation out of slavery. And he passed on, if you want to stay free, you need two things, property and a gun. And um, we still have a lot of that property in South Carolina uh, as a result of freedom and the, and the, and the right of ownership of private property. Um, but, the, but this whole idea of redistribution, it violates that concept that people uh, can keep what they, uh, own, what they own. Uh, it violates the scripture. I mean, the 10th commandment says don't covet. And socialism is rooted in covetousness. Somebody has something somebody else doesn't have, so now we go hire politicians to go take it from them. Uh, and now it mounts it to theft because uh, the Eighth Commandment says don't steal. And people that say, oh, well, taxes aren't theft. Really? Uh, well, let's think about that. I don't get letters from the IRS saying, would you like to benevolently give to this poverty program so people like Star Parker can ruin her life? No, if you don't pay your taxes, they will show up with a gun and take you to jail. So it is force, and that means it's theft when you don't want to. Uh, this whole idea of wealth redistribution, though, even with those other two factors of how it abuses the very people that we say that we want to help, um, under the guise of social justice, it violates the very social structures that one needs uh, to excel, to break out of the out of poverty and to break that cycle for their family. Uh, because without moral codes of ethics and a, and a uh, rule of law, society diminishes to what one social scientist called the tragedy of the commons. 
No one owns it, so no one takes care of it. It's a tragedy of the commons, and that's what we see in absolutely every impoverished community in our society today. And when we were doing welfare reform, I consulted on that bill during the 90s, and I remember doing pep talk time, uh, then Senator Phil Graham would come in all the time and just tell everybody that I've never seen a man wash a rented car uh, just to keep us motivated. And we sit there, hmm, yeah, we don't wash rented cars, do we? We wash our own cars, though, so ownership has value. And when you have a welfare state where no one owns it, no one then takes care of it. And far too many Americans now are lost inside of moral relativism and government dependency, uh, and they are simply expressing that in all of society and it's weakening us as a nation and it certainly has weakened them uh, as a human that has potential. Uh, I thank God every single day for my Christian conversion and not saying that everyone uh, will be able to experience that type of joy and or conversion. What we do want to do is make sure we stop the hemorrhaging of human capital uh, because of the laws that we have um, promoted in our society. Uh, over the last 50 years that have encouraged ill behaviors. Uh, and those, beha those behaviors are recognizable in data. Uh, the nuclear family, for instance, in 1970, 40% of all American households were headed by married couples with children. Okay, in 1970, 40% of American households were headed by married couples with children. Today, that number is 18%. Uh, and single families, uh, the data gets even worse. In 1970, only 7% of American children live with a mother who had never married. Okay, think about that. In 1970, I know you're a student, so you might not remember that time, but you're studying history, so uh, you have to think about it in that context, I suppose. Gosh, history? 70s? Oh, no, I'm getting old. Um, okay, but in 1970, your parents might have been around, your grandparents. Only 7% of American children live with a mother who had never married. In 2014, that number was 48%. Births outside of marriage. Here's how marriage has collapsed. When you collapse ethics, you collapse marriage. The births outside of marriage, blacks moved from 22% in the 60s to 72% today. You know, people see, think a lot of the pathology we see in our hard-hit communities has just always been that way. And in fact, you'll have black leaders that get up and say, oh, this is just an extension of slavery and Jim Crow. No, actually, family life just collapsed over, um, over these last 50 years of the social engineering of the left to promote these ill values against our established um, traditions uh, in our society. And when you think of the, the opposite, of the 22%, the 78% were in the home with their wives raising their children, uh, is black families. But whites aren't looking any better. In the 60s, white out of wedlock birth rates were at 3%. Today, they're 30%, eight points higher than where blacks were in the 60s, which is why now some of the pathologies that we thought were definitely in the ghetto are also now in our suburban communities, uh, and the hemorrhaging continues, and some of the same challenges are erupting all across this country. The Latinos, uh, there was no data in the 60s. They're, they were not a special interest group um, to be politically exploited, but they are today, so therefore we keep data today, uh, and their out of wedlock birth rates are 53%. Well, why does this matter? I mean, you could come from the philosophy that it's none of our business and people should be able to do whatever they want to do. Well, there are three societal reasons that it should matter to us. The first one is child poverty. Now, you might not care, but child poverty uh, is something that we should be concerned about uh, as, as a nation uh, and for a variety of reasons, not for, just for the children, uh, which I'll get into. Because according to Ron Haskins of the Brookings Institution, in 2009, this is the year after the most recent economic collapse, the poverty rate for children in homes with married couples was 11%. But the poverty rate for children in homes headed by a single mom of 44.3%. We have 500,000 orphans in our foster systems. We have 1.2 million households that are living in our public housing uh, units. You know, many of us are very thankful that Dr. Ben Carson is now uh, going to head HUD. In fact, I did my recent uh, column before he was confirmed. Uh, wow, a doctor goes to HUD. It needs it. It needs a doctor. We need real serious surgery there. And when you're looking at one governmental unit that controls 90% of the mortgages in this country, we should be wondering what happens with the day that Fannie and Freddie really collapse uh, because they um, might not be thought of as too big to fail on the next go around. Uh, the second societal reason to care is of crime. Uh, when you think about crime as an extension of the family breakdown, 70% of the youth in our criminal justice system come from single-headed households. You know, people want to look at race dynamics and, you know, and, and, and come up with different types of strategies accordingly. 
But at the end of the day, it's single-headed households. <laughs> you know, when you think about, in fact, it's one of the reasons that I got so involved in this after the 92 riots, because the data is the same all across the country. And when the dust settled after the riots, we found that 70% of the people that were out there burning down other people's property were from single-headed households. People whose dad was in the house were not in the street. And this is why we should be concerned. 95% of the men in our federal prison system have no relationship with their dad. Uh, and then the third reason that we should care as a society uh, about these diminishing uh, values, uh, the, the getting too far away from our founding principles, because the law has encouraged um, illicit living uh, and, and, and has really moved the landmarks, uh, is because of diminished morale. The great society of secular statism has great cost both human and economic costs. The economic costs now, the federal government has taken 25% of the American economy, forcing the public square to be a battleground for constant conflict. This is one of the reasons that right now oh, we're walking on eggshells as the confirmation hearings have just began about the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court shouldn't be as active as it is and has become over the last 50 years. But the reason for this is because we have such constant conflict uh, because of the federal role in our lives. You start limiting the role of government, life becomes a little bit more peaceful for everyone and you don't have so many court cases that are uh, addressing cultural issues and, and social issues. Uh, but now that federal government has taken 25% of the American life. Poverty is big business. And in fact, some estimates are saying $24 trillion since the war on poverty began. Hey, you know what? If it was a good investment, you could name something that's working, I wouldn't mind. But the poverty rate has not changed. Now, marriage rates changed. I just told you how marriage rates changed. Single living changed. Uh, but poverty hasn't. It's still 25% of the of the society and it goes up and down and what's interesting by the for those that are constantly saying that we're going to end poverty uh, and we're going to have a war on poverty they're not the same people <laughs> that are poor and so you have to understand that you want people to transition out of poverty many people have started poor and then they don't have to be especially in a great country like ours uh, the federal government spends 900 billion dollars annually on these anti-poverty programs that's a quarter of the budget uh, that we are uh, putting into uh, alleviating poverty in other people's lives. And, uh, and the challenge is that it's big business, not just for those that are perhaps living day to day off of Uncle Sam. Uh, more than 250,000 American businesses that are non-grocery store are now on food stamps. Um, when we're arguing the Ag Bill in Washington, D.C., it's not the welfare moms showing up saying, I want to keep my food stamps, don't you touch them. Oh, well, no, it's um, business interests. It's Kraft Foods because it's 10% of their bottom line. Uh, and since the welfare moms must buy cheese, uh, they kind of want to keep it that way. So it's Walmart because their machines are not able to scan the difference between food and, and, and regular uh, commerce. And so therefore, they think the taxpayer should help with the uh, machinery so that they can read now the EBT swipe card. The EBT swipe card itself is big business since um, George Bush brought that to town, thinking that he would save money through paper and maybe even get rid of governmental waste. And it just increased a whole new business. And in fact, if you look at the EBT swipe card, it'll put your black um, American Express card to shame because they just been a whole lot uh, to make sure that it's big and beautiful. And actually, most of them have the symbol of the states on them and, uh, and their, their flags. And they're just very creative little swipe cards. You can go into Trader and it says uh, debit, credit, EBT. Uh, so yeah, it's McDonald's wondering, how come we can't take the EBT swipe card? We sell food. How come they get to take it and we don't? This is the challenge with big government, uh, because then everybody wants on the dole. It's kind of like what um, uh, Bastiat said in the law when he was looking at separations. This is the challenge with plunder. Sometimes you have many plundering the few. You have everybody plundering everybody, and that's where we are today. Or we just stop the plunder, uh, which is what some of us in Washington hope we have an opportunity to do over the next four, perhaps eight years. Uh, because in 1960, 20% of Americans got more from government than they put in. Today, 60% of Americans get more from government than they put in. And you should be concerned about this as young people. You know, some of you that buy into these liberal tendencies and think, well, this is fascinating. We just love the fact that government takes from the wealthy and gives to the poor. Uh, until, like Margaret Thatcher says, you run out of other people's money, then what? And especially if you, you're studying business, too, you're going to be the wealthy one day. I don't think you're going to like Uncle Sam coming and taking half of your money uh, to try to give to somebody that hasn't been deserving of it because they decided not to go to the same school that you went to or to even study the school that they did go to. Government dependency has seeped into every part of our society now, and we're now $22 trillion in debt with unfunded liabilities for these Ponzi schemes. Some estimates are saying that that is looking at $100 trillion uh, because these baby boomers, whoo, 15000 a day, mm, 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 turning 65 years old. This is not looking good. 
And well, I'm hoping we're going to have discussions about personal retirement accounts where money can follow uh, people uh, to, to an IRA instead of the IRS. There's something wrong with a system that, that says, you know, uh, we're, we, current workers pay for current retirees. You know, Ponzi schemes are illegal in this country. If you were, if you were in a business, uh, you wouldn't be able to do what the Social Security does, where they take current to pay for the retirees. And the challenge is that pyramid's upside down. Uh, when you think about that baby boomer, yeah, 85 million of those folks and living longer lives and then bought the environmental lie that children are the environmental hazards, so don't have too many. So while uh, grandmama had nine, mama had five, I had two and lost one of those. So the pyramid, everybody did that and we just turned it upside down. And so there are not as many of those baby boomers to be able to support, um, you know, the, the, there's not as many of the, um, the Gen Xers to support those baby boomers. And for those of you that think, well, we'll just buy into the ideas of euthanasia, we go to the gym, too. See, so you're not going to be able to do that. Plus, we believe in the right to bear arms, and so you won't be able to just kill us off. You might be, want to just think about personalizing Social Security instead. Well, the human cost. Those are the economic costs, but the human cost, we're just not free anymore. We're no longer free people. This is what big government has done to us as a society. We're not free when judges get to redefine truth. We're redefining words. Someone asked me the other day, I did an interview, and they asked me about uh, marriage. I said, well, you know, marriage already has a meaning, and it's had for years. And one of the bigger challenges, even though this is an um, uh, incredible challenge in cultural uh, matters uh, with, with, with what they're calling gay marriage, but the bigger challenge is that if you just get to decide to change any word's meaning at any time, then all words lose their meaning. Then nothing means anything anymore. If I don't want to call this a book anymore, I don't have to. We just, every word is subjective, and that is something that we should uh, be concerned about, judges overreaching and deciding that they're going to take 6,000-year-old uh, words and change the definition of them. We're just not a free people when politicians can pass laws to force Americans uh, to subsidize violent and destructive behaviors. Uh, there are some very interesting uh, cases that are at the court and that will be heard over this next session uh, just on these cultural matters uh, because government has just slipped too far into the personal lives of individuals and have passed laws uh, that then violate other people's freedom. Uh, we're just not free when bureaucrats can segment us into special interest groups based on race and gender and sexual identification, uh, pitting family against family and friend against friend, neighbor against neighbor, employer against employee, young against the old, the God-fearing against the atheists. We're a very divided nature, uh, nation now, just to further a social philosophy that throughout history has been proven to reduce mankind to savagery. Uh, so, you know, what we should have learned as a nation from both slavery and from Jim Crow is that force is just not an American ideal. No more than should my auto insurance cover your tuna than should my health insurance cover your sex life, not your Viagra not your condoms, not your sex change operations, not your birth control devices, and certainly not your abortion. Our challenge in America today, getting back to the subject at hand, the values, is that out of control debt, enslavement the government, and broken families is just not a formula for a great country. Uh, the good news is we can change. The good news is we can really change. Every part of our society that's untouched by government is going just fine. I mean, look at the iPhones. The only reason I'm not using my iPhone right now is because it's too squinchy and I'm too vain to put on my glasses. But, um, and I have to get back to my four turning five-year-old grandchild so she can show me how to increase the size. She knows how to do that. She knows how to download Mickey apps, so I know she knows how to do that, too. I mean, everything is changing. We're, we're still free. We're really free. Look at Uber. Well, you can't look at Uber. You didn't have Uber. I'm trying to figure it out, Uber up here. I guess it's like, what, there's just not enough people for Uber? You're getting Uber? Yeah. Uber's great. <laughs> oh, that entire gig business, that entire gig industry, it's just incredible what's happening. We're entrepreneurship in America and those opportunities are overflowing. And it's just, it's, you guys are going to be amazed once you get your degrees out of a university like this where you're focused on these um, entrepreneurial and freedom and free market um, and economics. Uh, the, the, the how many opportunities. America where it's free is still free. It's where we see political force and big government that we see um, stagnation and that's where we have to change things. Is it too late to change? No. I, I really don't believe so. In fact, that's one of the reasons I do my work in Washington, D.C. But we have to start making the changes and they're not going to happen overnight. And changing public policy regarding poverty is a major way to tur turn things around and that's what we are working on. So real quickly, four things that I'm working uh, right now with this new administration to help them strengthen that weakest link so that we can restore freedom, respect, and responsibility in our, in our land. Four things. Number one, end abortion subsidies. Abortion is not salvation. In fact, it's a crime against humanity. So America should not be doing it, and we should not be exporting it around the world. 
because in addition to the moral implications of abortion and the mental and the medical complications, abortion feeds into this narrative of victimhood, as if women have no control over their sexual impulses, and as a result, marriage has collapsed. When women control their sexual impulses, men marry them, and our marriage rates have collapsed. They dropped from 75 percent the adult population in the 70s to 45 percent today. And for blacks, marriage has totally collapsed as well because blacks are lured into this welfare state philosophy very early on. And within five years after King's death, Roe v. Wade was national law. Very vulnerable population bought the ideas and it collapsed families to where now marriage is only 30 percent of the adult population there. Conjugal and sacramental marriage is the capstone of all humanity and it's unraveling our society as we allow it to um, trickle down into chaos. Now look what's happened. Homosexuality is dividing us and bringing hostility into the public square. I mean, all sexual behaviors are adult behaviors. They should be private. But now we're talking to four and five year olds about them because in the courts. Abortion, we're talking 68 million dead in 44 years. That should give us all a great pause, especially when we see cases like Kermit Gaz now, where he's storing body parts, maiming, molesting, and murdering women and their babies for Planned Parenthood selling off body parts. Men and women need to begin taking responsibility over their sexual lives again, and, and legalized abortion is an impediment. Adults should not be viewed as victims, but as agents to govern their own destinies. And the bookshelves are sagging with data that demonstrates with crystal clarity the relationship to crime, to poverty, poverty, lack of work, lack of work, to lack of education, lack of education, to lack of family structure. If you don't want to be poor in America, you get educated, you get a job, you get married before you get pregnant, you have children after you're married, you save and invest some money, and then you give some time and treasure to a local charity. If you do these things in America, your, your chances of being poor are really minuscule. All of the data shows this. Yet in poor communities all across the country, we have left these behavior checkpoints um, unchecked, and people now are living lives of desperation. Uh, the second thing we need to do is, um, is uh, charity and corporate tax credits. We have to target them, so we need to block grant all welfare entitlement programs to the state. It's including housing policy. Allow for corporate charities, tax credits, targeting specific zip codes, uh, include for ideas for states to be, come up with their own uh, thinking. States are where we should be looking for ways to uh, remove barriers to mobility and incorporate market-based ideas to help the working poor uh, and our at-risk children. You know, it's interesting because every time I come into Michigan, now I see your little pure Michigan ad because they play it. I live in California. Uh, even though I work in Washington. Um, and so they were out there, all your ads, wanting us to come to Michigan and go on vacation. I'm like, I'm in California, well, pure Michigan. One of them really got my attention, though. They said 85 summers. And I'm like, 85 summers, what does that mean? And by the end of the ad, when he showed us all these wonderful things that you could do in Michigan, he said 85 summers. And I thought about it. I think I was like 50 at that time. I'm like, 85 summers? I only have 35. What? And I don't have, uh, I must have been 55, because I said, I only have 30 more summers to go. And so then I started going on vacation, not up here yet, but I might one day, I don't know. Uh, but it just, but the reason I'm bringing it up is because, because your state decided we're hemorrhaging. We better do something. Well, what do we have? Lakes. Wow. Boats. Ooh, hotels. And they began this campaign to say, oh, let's, let's at least do hospitality. I met a gentleman, one of your colleagues at school, who's studying hospitality. I'm like, oh, dude, you're going to do really well. Because all those baby boomers who are doing that inheritance right now, we not only live a long lives, we're enjoying those lives. And so hospitality is really growing. <laughs> All states should be thinking about working on creative experiments and pilot programs. Dallas is doing it with housing reforms to, to let HUD recipients go live anywhere. They should be able to go anywhere. Why is HUD in the housing? What is the government doing in the housing business? You think about it. We distribute food stamps. We don't go in the grocery store business. Oh, don't give them any ideas. I don't want them to go in the grocery store business. <laughs> South Carolina, they now have tax incentives to attract job creators into the rural communities. I guess you guys know that because I think they took a few companies from here. But you know why they did that? The same reason that you guys became right to work. What did they say? They said, you come in our state, your tax is this small. You go into that neighborhood, no tax. Now, you can try to manipulate them into doing it. Money's fungible. Corporations, that, that money's got to go create more of itself. That's what it does. That's its nature. So you, you're just not going to come up with some social experiment to say, those greedy corporate giants, we're going to have to do something to manipulate them to stop making money. Oh, no, it'll just go wherever it has to go. So you want to create conditions for it to stay here. Kansas on criminal justice reform by partnering with their youth correctional programs uh, with their private charities. And then Galveston, oh, they, they personalized retirement a long time ago to be flexible in private ownership. And then another thing we have to do is parental choice in education. That's the final thing. Just, enough cannot be said. 
or done about this only opportunity that we as a society get to interject ourselves into other people's children's lives. It's the only opportunity. We're, we're, not, we're, we're not China, so we can't have internet controls. We're not Iran, we're not going to uh, do the entertainment controls and make sure that nobody has a TV. We're just, this is the only place that we get to go into somebody else's home. This is the only place that American society said we're going to pool our resources because we believe an educated populace is a civil populace, so we're going to pool our resources through our property taxes and pay for other people's children to go to school. So why is the government in the education business? Money should follow children to the schools the parents want. K through 12 is the only place that we as a free society can direct the culture of our youth. And boy, did they need direction. Those values that collapsed in the 60s collapsed through the educational process. That is when we saw the growth of government in education, and by 1979, we had a Department of Education. Many of you know the name Michael Brown, and some of you know the name Simone Biles. Michael Brown, Ferguson. Simone Biles, the gold. What's the difference? They both grew up in the tragedy of the commons. That's where they started life. No one owned it, no one took care of it. They both, their family, were in a set of circumstances they were born into, were everything that we know that's ill in our hardest hit pockets, our most vulnerable communities. But the difference was that Simone Biles was adopted by her granddad and then put in a Catholic school. They had the resources to put her in a school where men wore collars and had a stick in one hand and a Bible in the other. They then took her out of that school and homeschooled her. And she ended up brilliant, acclaimed. We all love her. She brought home the gold. Michael Brown, we saw his chaotic family. Michael Brown, two weeks before we saw his blood running in the streets of Ferguson, received his high school diploma from a school that had lost its accreditation. It was a worthless piece of paper. He grew up in the tragedy of the commons, and his, well, we saw the, you know, I guess from the biblical one, and that one you're with is not your husband either, jumping on the car, saying, burn this down. Um, the only place we could have gotten him in society was a, is in that educational classroom. But <laughs> Missouri has a Blaine Amendment. It's unconstitutional, according to their state, for money to follow children to the schools the parents may have chosen. And even though his mom, we saw her, she had issues. But what's fascinating about poor parents, in the worst situations, they want better for their children. So those that do get availed to vouchers take their children to private religious schools, Catholic schools more than anything. Uh, then the, a few of the others, too. But that's what we have to do in our society is allow for educational options. In fact, one of the cases at the Supreme Court is about Missouri's blame. And that's why we're hoping that we can get one more court appointment before that case is heard and get a decision that might solve two questions. One, should a child be trapped in a failing school that doesn't even have an accreditation? Where is there even window to leave? And number two, religious liberties, because it's a playground case where um, uh, a religious school may the, use the tar or the, the tires to make the playground. And um, the state said that violates the separation rule that they have. And so it's at the court. So in closing, uh, uh, Forbes magazine just had a recent quote. You can't change things by fighting the existing reality. To change things, you have to build a new model to make the existing model obsolete. So that's what we're trying to do in Washington, D.C., and I hope that uh, I've shared a few thoughts about some of the things that we are working on that will encourage you to maybe uh, focus some ideas for where you could help change whatever reality uh, surrounding your life uh, needs to be changed so that you can build a new model to make whatever that model is obsolete. Thank you. For questions, you said? Mm -hmm. right, we've, got, we've got the microphone here. If anybody has a question, or if you've written one down on the cards, just pass those to the aisles and we'll pick those up. Uh, so let's open it up for questions and answers. Hello, Star. Hello. 
Um, how do you think that right to work, or do you think that right to work will help um, impoverished communities uh, give more opportunities to people to lift themselves from poverty? Oh, I think that right to work allows for people to put their talent on the table, and, and it allows for a, an employer uh, to pay what that value is to his company. Um, one of the challenges that we have in our most impoverished communities is the extension of, of unions and, and wage laws. Um, when you think about minimal wage law in and of itself, you know, lo many think about that first rung, which it does hinder people from entering in, especially if you're low skilled. Uh, and, and someone giving you the opportunity to uh, share with them if you have the ability to um, show up and, and, and do a good job so that they then could give you a, a higher wage over time. Um, it's not just that first rung that's hurting these impoverished communities, and that does hurt because it means that your youth are heavily unemployed. Anytime you see increases in uh, wage law, uh, minimum wage they call it, uh, the livable wage sometimes they want to call it, uh, anytime you see an increase, you start seeing the increase in unemployment with the youth. But it's not just that rung, and especially now in a technological age, uh, we should be concerned about that third rung as well. You know, think about a, 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 a um, well, let's think about a fast food store like McDonald's. Uh, that, McDonald's has to have someone to clean the store and to cook the food. You know, those two things are necessities uh, in a food establishment but they don't necessarily have to have that cashier because she's replaceable by machine now. So we have to be really careful when we decide that somebody's being paid too low, and especially somebody that's sitting in some cushy office and never ran a business, uh, because if now McDonald's is forced to pay the cleaner, who's the lowest rung, $15 an hour, which is what some are saying, $18 an hour, it's going to be $30 an hour. I don't know where they came up with whatever that hour should be anyway uh, from the beginning. But let's just say it's 15, which is what most are arguing for. But they're paying him 15 or her $15 an hour. What are they paying the cook? Because usually it's the cook that doesn't want to be paid the same as the cleaner because usually they bring a little bit more skill to the table. So if they're paying now the cook, let's just say they want to give the cook three more dollars. So they're going to give the cook $18. What are they paying the cashier? Because the cashier has more skill. And is working with money and uh, working with customers they're paying her nothing because although she's working with money and customers, $20 an hour is a little more than that retailer might want to spend when he can buy a machine. Uh, and we can just kind of EBT swipe. Well, they don't get the EBT yet, but they're working on it. Uh, but they can certainly, um, you know, credit card swipe. So it, it's, it's a good thing to have right to work. We, it, it, this is one of those areas that you have to wonder how in the world do we get to the place that we even have to pass a law called right to work. We want to work. You know, you want to be able to just work. And what that means, if you, if you don't like the job, quit and go get another one that will be fulfilling. Uh, I think one of the challenges that we see with too much union uh, extension is people feel that they're stuck in jobs that they don't even like because of a benefit and a, and a political promise uh, that might not even come to pass. And especially now in your state, you're finding that it's not going to happen. Uh, the pensions that were promised are just have many of the areas upside down. Uh, and it's a big challenge. Uh, you know, you want to make those payments because they were promised. But this is, this, this is a difficult question for the politicians, especially in this state, uh, to try to solve. In fact, I was with, recently in your state. And one of the mayors, I really felt bad for him. He has more owed out uh, than, uh, than able-bodied workers in the whole area now. People move. People also are fungible. They move. If they don't want to be anywhere anymore, they're going to leave, uh, just like business will leave. And so what we have to do is get creative about how we can limit the role of government, limit the regulations, limit the, 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 the taxation. I'm not saying get rid of all of it, but it is excessive right now. And so we need to, and you should, your state and your local community should look for ways to uh, attract business and attract human capital. And you do that by, it, by limiting uh, excessiveness in their lives. So. Thank you. You're welcome. I hate to say that in a union state, but it is true. But we have our own problems in California, so I don't feel like you know, I've got our own but issues. We have a question from a note card. Mm -hmm. Recently, big cities have been run by the left. These mm -hmm. politicians haven't done anything to improve the African American community, mm -hmm. but they continue to be elected with the African American vote. Mm -hmm. So my question is, why do African Americans continue to vote these people into office? 
Do you think it is from a lack of education? It's twofold. One, it, you have many, the gerrymandering that has gone on uh, in our society um, it has done a disservice to, in particular, these communities because uh, you, you don't, you, there's no one else to vote for. <laughs> Democrats only was running, so, you know, the people vote for them as a result of that. But the bigger challenge with the black community uh, is we focus on the, on the hard pocket that's broken. Uh, and that hard pocket that's broken, it's 5% of the black community. That part doesn't vote. The voters are the people that are the middle class, okay? It's like the broader society. It's the people that are much more engaged in, in their lives. And what has happened in black America? They have become workers of government. This is why we have a challenge. They vote for the left because it's lucrative. The blacks vote their economic interests like everyone votes their economic interests. And while you have a real hard part of the general population, you know, let's look at Detroit, there are a lot of things in Detroit that are not broken. And so what has happened in black America? We have 25% of the community that are on government, whether it's their senior citizens or their veterans or their um, active duty military now, or they're actually on welfare program, they're on SSI or some type of program. They get a government subsidy. But another 23% work for government. This is the bureaucracy. The richest black community in the country is right outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, and all of the, the infrastructures of government, whether it's federal, city, state, county, I mean, there was an insistence coming out of um, Jim Crow and movement into middle class in black America where their children were conditioned to go get a government job. Uh, and so it, now we're overextended in government. Less than 3% of African Americans actually own their own business. And of that 3%, 80% of those businesses are mom and pop. They gross less than $100,000 a year. So African American community is an economic dilemma. It's one of the reasons that I fight hard for money to follow people to an IRA as opposed to the IRS. I want Social Security um, uh, privatized, personalized. And the reason is because this community needs one generation of transferable wealth. Uh, because you get, the poverty rate, you know, it's underappreciated that, you know, when you look at the actual numbers and why people would vote for big government, because that's what they're voting for, government, uh, to take care of things that they don't think they have the resources to take care of. And when you look at the resources or the potential for resources, it really is not there. The general population, the net worth is about 150000 The net worth in black America is about 7000 uh, so it's, does not, it's not a community that has had that, had that one opportunity to transfer wealth. And, the, um, and so Social Security is what stands in the way. And in fact, um, you know, when we look at King Solomon, he said, a good man leaves an inheritance of his grandchildren, and the wealth of the wicked is later for the just. Well, how does this happen if you're making $24,000 a year? The, the income level in black America, that medium income is like $32,000. So it's not a wealthy community. So when you think you make $32,000 a year, $35,000 a year, uh, there's not much to save, but if that money were put in a retirement account that you can transfer to your children, then in one generation, I think that we would see that shifting out of voting for big government. Uh, you know, you look at, you know, we can have long discussions and people say, God, why would, so yeah, why would they? Uh, well, but then if you get into, half of the black community still lives in the South. So you, so that Southern black vote is not showing up voting for liberals. Uh, I mean, they vote for liberals, but it doesn't reflect in their, in their interests because those southern states are run by Republicans. So life works for them in those states, even though they're voting for liberals. And the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, they can meet with the president all they want to today, but they're just doing nothing for these communities. All, the, all we hear from the Congressional Black Caucus is the problems of these communities are somebody else's fault. Uh, it's one of the reasons that my organization is fighting for charity tax credits as well, because the people that are trying to serve that pocket that is really broken and draining the rest of society that doesn't, um, that, uh, um, you know, that has ill, uh, the, the charities that serve them are underfunded. They don't have the resources, because when you have a community of people, your middle class thinks government should do all the work. They don't fund the, their outreaches. So we have to come up with a creative way to get money to those outreaches, and I think that we can do that through charity tax credits. Uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge, uh, but it's one of the challenges that I'm spending my life working on, because uh, it is a challenge to, to continue to send liberals 
uh, to office and then wonder why nothing changes. It's the definition of insanity. You, you keep doing the same thing and expect a different result, and it's getting worse. And yet there's no emphasis whatsoever out of the entire Congressional Black Caucus, the entire NAACP, the entire Urban League, to say maybe we should consider the two things that are really draining us socially and economically, collapsed ethics and collapsed marriage. Uh, we just can't seem to get to that, um, that question with any of those leaders. So one of the long-term goals of groups like mine is to replace those leaders. Any question? other questions? Okay. I think I went a little long, but um, I can stay as long as you Hi, Star. Th thanks for being here tonight. And it was a remarkable presentation. I appreciate we it. We also had the opportunity to see a remarkable presentation in this auditorium last night. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with John Hans and uh, Hans Farm in Detroit. That I'm not familiar, but I heard about his yeah. presentation. Yeah, and that's correct. He, they showed the documentary, and throughout the documentary, uh, the whole project was just uh, facing opposition from yeah. really, which didn't seem like it was uh, logical. No, it's not. And so I was thinking about it on the way home last night, and I thought I'd be angry. Yeah. Instead, I had a, another feeling, which is one of our other values, which is empathy. Right. So my question for you is, what do you think of the state of empathy in our government today? In the government? Um, Among our leaders. <laughs> I think that there's an encouraging sign in this new president, for whatever reason, he just is going to fix this problem. It's almost like a, um, you know, my grandson, when he was, uh, he, he's got kind of like a little scientific mind. When he was like four or five and something broke, I mean, he, would, he was not going to bed until he fixed that truck. Um, so. It is, it, the, it, we, it's not the government's role to be empathetic, for one. They need to get out of the way of charity. They should have never gone in the charity business. That's one of the biggest challenges, to build out a welfare state. Um, you know, and then they tried all this compassionate conservative, okay, so we're going to get the women off welfare and have to put the churches on. Uh, no, what we need to do is um, allow free people to freely help free people that are in need. And the way you do that is through allowing people to give locally. We sit in, with that $900 billion that goes to Washington, uh, less than 20 cent on a dollar actually gets back to that household. That's how thick bureaucracies are. That's not empathy. Who, I remember when I was on welfare, my caseworker, I'm dressed better than she did. Her attitude was bad. She was supposed to come check my house to make sure no man lived there. And she told me, if anyone ever asked, just pretend I came by. And she said, because I want to go to lunch with my girlfriends. The bureaucracy is, there's no empathy. This is a job. They're only doing their job. I have to see 25 people a week. There's no, let's help them. In fact, when we passed welfare reform, there were only two real harsh, harder, or I guess I should say, requirements, uh, in the, because it was a lot more flexible for the states. Uh, but there were two, time limits and work requirements. And I tell you, we thought the liberals had already died and gone to hell. They were just so miserable. The fact that we would just ask these folks to work and to limit the time because we knew that time is a social stabilizer and it will help them sit up straight and start thinking about their lives. We knew that, you know, the 65% uh, had a high school diploma, one child, work experience. This was not rocket science. We could really help this and move it along. But it's now entrenched three generations. Um, you know, it's tragic because, one, you have the, 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 the people that want to support the status quo, insisting that Americans will never give away their money. Are you kidding? Not only do you confiscate $900 billion a year, Americans then give away another $400 billion in this country, and then another $300 billion abroad. This is over and above everything that government. So, and every time something goes bad, we show up immediately. Um, in fact, I was just read in this column about the homeless guy. He said um, that uh, he, the rainstorm came in the L.A. You know, we don't get rain, so nobody knew what to do, including the homeless. They were like, oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? We're, just, we're outside. We don't know what to do. So, uh, so he said, man, maybe they need some tarps, you know, so that they won't get soaked. I mean, it's going to be a huge storm. So he put on his little Facebook page, hey, I'm going to go buy some tarps for the homeless people. In like a couple of hours, he raised $800. He bought all these tarps and put them out there for the homeless people. You know, Washington should not be doing this work. Uh, and that's one of the biggest challenges. So we have to do, Paul Ryan has had a plan since he showed up. And so maybe under this administration, we can actually get it in law to where we get this work back to the states where it belongs, you know, and, and allow people to get creative. We don't want empathy in government. We want them to do their role. What is it that they're to do? They protect our interest, not plunder our interest. 
They protect our interests. And so um, there, there should be a lot more emphasis there. Empathy belongs to the people that are passionate about whatever the, the crisis is that they're trying to fulfill. And for folks to pretend that there's not people out there that are going to do the work, every single community has somebody working on almost every single area of brokenness, whether it's drug addiction or homeless, or whether it's um, a crisis pregnancy, or whether it's a, a, a orphan. Every community has all of these things, whether it's recidivist, they're just little. Because government is competing with them and taking all of the money from the people. So we want ch charity tax credits. This should go straight to, um, straight to the folks. It's, it's, it's going to be harder, and it's getting harder generation after generation. I was just down in Alabama, and a couple of teachers walked up to me and said, oh, so you run a think tank up there in Washington? I said, mm-hmm. She said, well, you all need to go think about this. And I said, well, what? She said, well, we're, our girls are coming back in here at 14 years old with a black eye from mama because mama said don't bring home a bee. Mama said bring home a baby. And mama said if you don't bring home a baby, you're going under your uncle because you're going to have a baby. We got to get out of this business. We got to get out of this business. I don't want empathy from the government. They've had 50 years of empathy through their welfare state, and look what it has wrought. Uh, so no, the, the passionate and compassionate people do local work. They get into people, and they look them in the eye, and they help them solve their problem. Uh, there's one size fits all doesn't work. It doesn't fit. It never did. It, uh, I've been in those shops where they say it's going to fit and it doesn't. And all ladies know one size fits all doesn't really fit all of us. <laughs> we don't buy that stuff and it doesn't work in helping people with poverty. You know how I got off welfare? Because I went to get some money under the table, went into a business in South Central LA because Uncle Sam is cruel. The rules were don't work, don't save, don't get married. We'll kind of keep you enslaved to this poverty plantation. But I wanted more, so I wanted some money. So I went in this business trying to get them to give me a little under the table, and they said they didn't pay like that. They were legitimate businessmen. They looked me in my eye and pointed their finger in my face and told me my lifestyle was unacceptable. Well, government can't do that. In fact, they shouldn't have done that. I said, unacceptable to who? They said, God. And I got out of there. I never even heard of God, but for some reason that was just like, uh, for the first time, I actually started thinking about all the things that I'd done, all the breaking and entering, the arm robbery. The, you know, y there's no one-size-fits-all to fix people's problems. That's why they should be in the private sector. Empathy comes from, and uh, uh, pity comes from people engaged, and usually it's because of a tragedy in their own lives. And we have people that are working in cancer. Uh, it's because cancer took somebody they love, so they have a passion. The people that are working in our homeless, someone they knew. The people that are working on crisis pregnancy, they experience these things. That's what you want in charity. Uh, charity is charity, and it belongs here. And what we have to do is figure out how do we get charity monies back over here. Uh, and that's some of the things that um, you have to creatively do to get government out of the way. Thank you. So I solved all the problems in the world? So now we can go to the beach. Oh, you don't have a beach. I do. <laughs> Thank you, Star. My name is Kristen Stehauer, and I serve as your Chief Academic Officer, and it's an honor to bring this evening's program to a close. We have some outstanding programming tomorrow evening as well, and we have our outstanding Alumni Achievement Awards, and that will be in RIPMA Arena, and it will include dinner if you RSVP to Dean Kripe, and that is C-R-I-P-E at Northwood.edu, and that will start at 5.30 in RIPMA Arena, so if you're interested in partaking in a really wonderful event celebrating our alumni who exemplify Northwood University's values, please RSVP to Dean Kripe. And then the programming will continue with a keynote address from our Lieutenant Governor, Brian Kelly, and that will begin at 7.45 p.m. If you haven't attended the dinner, you're certainly welcome to attend uh, Lieutenant Governor Kelly's speech, and there will be general seating for that. And both events will be in Reef Marina. I'd also like to make sure that we recognize our signature events team. It's a registered student organization here at Northwood University. If you could all just uh, raise your hands. We appreciate all that you've done this week. And Star Parker, you are amazing. You're an inspiration. Thank you for challenging us to advance our values of freedom, responsibility, and respect in innovative, wise, and responsible ways. Let's give her another round of applause. <laughs>